So this is the longest title that could fit on the slide. Um, basically, it's based on, we're talking about detection as code. Um, so already Jared introduced me, so I'll, I'll keep it very short. Um, my name's Olaf. I like warm hugs. Um, I'm a father of two boys, and I used to be a documentary photographer, so I never went to school for cyber. Um, doesn't really matter, I guess. Um, it proves what you do with it. So I, I'm a text engineer and security researcher, and that's kind of important for the rest of the context as well. Um, and I work at, work at Falcon Force. Um, I'm actually one of the founders of it. It's a Dutch-based company, but we provide services globally where we are one team as red and blue, so we're sort of a purple company. Um, and that allows us to do a lot of the things that we, uh, that we do also in this talk. So what you can expect here is basically why we started doing uh, the detection as code bit. Uh, what does it mean to us? Um, how we document and store and process and analyze everything? What are some of the benefits of that? And then how also how that can enable you to do automatic validation. And to start off a little bit there is, is we, we have a, a division that's called Falcon for Sentry, and basically that's doing the detect, analyze, and respond bit for our clients. Um, and that starts out with the ba most basic model that everybody knows, right? So you have all kinds of stuff that generates telemetry, there's all kinds of automated detection logic on top of that that generates alerts or indicators. Um, and they boil down into an incident, hopefully. Um, but there's, there's some issues with that, as was already alluded to in the previous talk. Um, so stock content is relatively easy to bypass. Every red teamer can buy an EDR, test whatever he wants to do, and know that he can, be, he can bypass everything. That's also what we do. Um, and then on top of that, there's all kinds of time wasted by repetitive alerts. Uh, alert fatigue, as was explained in the previous talk, so that saves me some time. Uh, but we're also not utilizing all of the telemetry that all of these tools provide us. And we don't know how well it's working, and if it's even working at all. So that's why we started expanding that model into all of those additional green blocks that we're doing, right? So we're building a lot of custom content, we're doing risk-based analysis and scoring on top of that. Uh, we're building an engine that can automatically enrich everything based on entities, but also on context. So maybe Bloodhound or other stuff will be used into those factors. But that's not why I'm here, right? I'm, I'm talking about the automatic deployment and the replay of a tech bit today. So it's one of the aspects in our whole ecosystem that we provide. So the detection as code is basically removing some of the challenges that I alluded to earlier. So who changed this rule and what was actually changed, right? Because an analyst, if it runs in a sim, can relatively easily make a modification that tunes something, which might actually break the whole detection or create all kinds of false negatives uh, for that matter. Um, but also, if, if I wanna make a change, what will, will it actually work, will it break? Uh, these kind of things, so those uncertainties will be partially addressed there. And also knowing, like, hey, when was this rule implemented and what was actually changed the last time we made a modification and what was that and, and when was that? Um, and it allows you to also ensure some of the quality of the detections, uh, follow best practices you might uh, want to follow, and also keep the documentation up to date because nobody does that, right? So um, we all want to do it, but we're all too busy to actually keep track of it. And if it's still working, that's maybe even more important. Are the data sources still there? Is the detection actually detecting the attack that I wrote it for? So all these kind of things we want to address. So detection as code to us, as Falcon Force, but basically most of the community will probably follow a sim similar thing, is we, we follow an agile process just to keep everything organized. We use a simple language as a markup language for all of our detection logic and we plan for reusability. And this is very important to us because we provide a service as consultants, but even in an internal organization, you might have multiple levels of detections running in different environments, or you did an acquisition and you can't merge your sims yet, so you have to deploy it on two places, and you don't want to copy paste everything. Uh, version control, as I started talking about earlier, is super important, um, and it's driven by automation, because we're a small company, we're also um, yeah, kind of tending to over-engineer things for the better, because we want to do cool stuff instead of replicating basic, uh, basic actions the whole time. 
and the unit testing based on realistic alerts. So we're not generating base telemetry, we're actually executing attacks constantly, automatically, uh, because then we actually know that it's doing what we expect it to be doing instead of triggering on a base set that we generated at some point that might not be realistic for the new way of it attacking it. So from that agile process, it's, it's, it's mostly common uh, uh, as everything, right? So we have a backlog, we prioritize, we write de dedicated documentation per detection. Um, then we test and review all these changes. So we test it in our lab environment where we have basically a small enterprise that we simulate um, and we review all the changes. So if I write a new detection or make a modification, then one of my colleagues actually has to look at what I did to make sure that we're um, doing the right things and not missing anything. And like every agile process, we have some stand-ups, which is like 15 minutes twice a week. So it's not, it's not over, over complicated there, where we also track progress, have some discussions and, and some planning sessions. And then we also organize our maintenance there because feedback from research or from developing detections is actually super important for the maintenance of the whole stack because we might have found a new way of detecting something or have a more optimized way of the query language, these kind of things that we can then factor in into all of our other ones if we want. So from a very simplified example, I have a new idea for a detection, I put it on the backlog, that gets planned in the planning session, and there we might, during a detection or a discussion already, figure out, hey, this is not feasible, we're, we're not gonna be able to do that, so we abandon it immediately. Um, otherwise, it moves on to the R&D phase, where we are starting to replicate that attack, looking at the telemetry, and, and basically uh, writing a detection for that which still can go wrong, right? There can be all kinds of reasons why we can either abandon it because we can't have the telemetry for it in a feasible way, or it gets blocked because for whatever reason, the telemetry is not there yet, but it will be. So then it gets blocked and we put it on a backlog later, or we abandon it at some point because it takes too long or it's not that prevalent anymore. But let's say we actually succeed, which usually is the case, fortunately. Um, we write our detection and we commit uh, it to Git, do a pull request, and it goes into the review and testing mode. So basically we already automatically deploy it, which I'll show you in a sec, to our test environment, where some colleague can actually review it, look at the output, look at how it's running, look at the performance and the quality of the code and the documentation. Um, and in some cases, there might be some feedback where it has to go back into R&D to improve or modify or make some altercation, and then it can still be abandoned, right? So that's always the case. Um, and if it's okay, then everything is happy, everything is fine, it gets accepted into the main repo and it gets deployed to one or multiple environments. So no surprise there, we use a Kanban board where we have the whole, the whole flow that I just uh, alluded to into multiple swim lanes. So we have a swim lane for use cases, we have one for our tech scripts, we have one for maintenance, and we have one for our enrichment and analysis pipeline, which didn't fit the screenshot. Um, and then we go into that file format. So make it as simple uh, to maintain as possible. You can have JSON and all kinds of funky stuff. Um, we work in the Azure environment primarily, so we use Kusto as a language, and they use ARM templates to deploy it, which is a huge JSON file which is horrible to maintain. So we, we chose YAML because it's super simple. We can still programmatically look at it and process it. So from there, try to be as expressive and simple as possible and plan for the code you use, which I'll give an example for. And we can, we can have like code re reuse, but also all kinds of lookup lists. So we have a list of the low best projects we can just have that in a single place and not put it into all of our detections because that's way much more work to maintain. And if you have it in the central place, you only have to maintain it once. So these kind of simple things um, are, are super nice. And then since we use YAML, we can actually build a schema for our whole, whole document so we can validate it programmatically, but also it's, it's super easy to maintain it because you can only choose from a couple of options on some of the fields. And then the next one is also designed for the ability to, to deploy to multiple environments. Even if you only have one SIM now, as I explained earlier, you might acquire a company or merge or whatever, 
want it to run in test and prod, you can, you can actually do that easier uh, if you do that this way. So what does it look like? So, so we have some identifiers in our, in our document, right? You need to give it a name, you need to give it an ID, and the ID is basically what it will look like in the sim in the end. Then we tag it with all kinds of stuff. So we, yeah, we call boost effect or suspicious behavior. You can, you can basically make up the list yourself. We have some qualifiers in which operating system are for expected false positive rate based on, on our experience. The severity we want to give to it, and of course, miter tags uh, for tactic, technique, and sub techniques. Next, we also provide a list of data sources that the query utilizes so that we can validate fairly easily if, if the data is even available. So we, we tell it the provider, so where does it come from, uh, which event ID or event name or action type, whatever it's called, um, which table it goes into, and then also, uh, again, the MITRE tech uh, data source components that they, uh, that they classify with that, so that we can generate overviews, which I'll show you later. Then the, the, the everybody's favorite bit is the documentation, especially the analysts will love you if you do this well, where we have a brief technical description of what the query actually tries to do, a description of the attack, so what does the attacker want to achieve with its attack, so what are we looking at, some considerations which could be anything for the analyst to be aware of, some known false positives, so that's easier to, uh, to classify. Some known blind spots, because you can, you can tailor a detection in a specific direction knowing that you're not looking at that bit. So you can classify that there, right? So we know that we're only focusing on this. The other thing is addressed in either that detection or we don't do it because of X, Y, Z. And then a basic response plan. And of course, that depends on your uh, internal uh, requirements, what you want to do with this. Uh, for one client, we built even a whole playbook design in there, which would uh, automatically be deployed into their Confluence instance with graphs and everything. So this can be very flexible. Um, we also maintain a change log within the detection so that we know who, what was changed when and what the impact of that change might be. Again, this is for multiple environment tracking extremely useful, but even for generic overviews, so you can at least have some basic indication what was changed without having to go through the whole commit log. Um, then some basic deployment information, so where do we want to deploy it? So the language in this case is Custo, but it could also be SPL or whatever you like. The platform that we intended it to be deployed to, so in this case it's Defender for Endpoint, uh, but we can also deploy it to Sentinel, and then we can have uh, some, some of the, the how often should it run, which entities should be extracted, these kind of information to it. And then, of course, the most important bit is the query. So this is a, a relatively simple example, just to make it a bit legible. Um, and we use some, some Jinja formatting that I'll, I'll show you later, and I'll explain why. Um, because this is where it becomes powerful with the detection as code. And then you get basically a structure like this. So I mentioned the schema support already, and uh, this is kind of nice, because in VS Code, there's already a way that it knows, hey, for permissions required, you can only use this. So if you type anything else, you'll get an error, so you can't even fully commit it yet. And it also makes it easier, right? So you know I can type this. Um, and you can just select it and click it. So that Jinja templating that I mentioned, um, this, is where I, this is what I really, really like. Is, is so Jinja is basically a, a Python module that you can use and allows you for templating. So all the green bits are basically template blocks, which we can automatically replace uh, in our pipeline. And we can even specify defaults. So in the, uh, that doesn't work, but in the top line you see a time frame with a default of one hour. So if I don't specify this at all, it will take the default. That's basically sort of what you have to get from that. And then we can, we can have also even if else statements if we want to make it really fancy. So we can, we can actually be super flexible. So in example one, we have a customer that uh, doesn't want to exclude or does want to exclude the servers. And there's some filtering for their environment there. So when we run the pipeline, we basically get an output like this. So the time frame wasn't specified here, so it uses the default. Um, also, the initiators one uses the default, and then it adds those two green lines that were mentioned here as a post filter, and it will generate the rest of it because the, the uh, exclude servers is true, so this whole block gets added too. For client two, they want it to only run every four hours. They don't want to exclude the servers. 
and they have PowerShell added to it. So basically when we ran it there, it looks very different, right? Even though the same base query is there. We can make it extremely flexible this way, which makes it also way easier to maintain because we only have to maintain this bit and then two clients get a new detection. That's sort of why we started doing this. And this is also where, where version control uh, becomes very useful because we can track all changes via commits, we can enforce or at least have peer reviews. So we can, yeah, depending on your organization and your procedures, you can enforce it or not, but right? you can also make the um, sort of agreement that, hey, you never push your own stuff into the master branch or main branch um, unless it's extremely important, whatever. There, there should be a fallback mechanism. Um, and this allows also, so if I make a mistake, excellently push it, I can roll it back as well. And the awesome bit here is we have one single source of truth now. So if an analyst, for whatever reason, makes an adjustment in production, our pipeline will override it. Um, so the, 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 the chance of faultiness is way lower this way. And that also allows all kinds of cool stuff because now we have it in Git. We can do CICD based stuff where we can do all kinds of actions, automatic deployments, but also validations on it. So yeah, this is basically what it looks like, right? You have all kinds of nice plugins for VS Code where you can actually see who made that commit and what they did, when they did it. And this is basically how it looks on our end. So we can see that syntax validation and the deployment was successful. So the reviewer already knows, hey, the code at least ran and is up to our standards and then still has to look at it to see if also the detection is. And this is where we go more into the automatic validation and deployment bit. So from a pipeline perspective, um, it's kind of nice because it enforces or it enables us, I'm not sure it enforces, but it enables us to do static and dynamic testing of every detection that we build. So we can do linting, we have a language server, and we can have all kinds of practice checks built into our validation so that we don't have to do that manually every time because people overlook stuff, everybody's busy. And it also allows us to be sure that all environments that we talk to are running the version that we want. And, and of course, best of all, it generates all kinds of documentation, playbooks, whatever, and put into the place that you want it. So, and uh, last but not least is also that it, it allows for automatic detection validation in most cases. And in most cases is some attacks are very hard to script. You can't sometimes script it or it requires certain permissions that you don't want to have a pipeline have. Like nobody wants a global admin on their pipeline in Azure DevOps because there's all kinds of nice tech techniques that you can then apply to it. So basically per environment we have four separate pipelines. So one that does the test cases, so does the attacks. One that analyzes the attacks. One does uh, a, a standard app output to Git, and one that is doing all of the other magic. Uh, we call it hatchery because we're Falcon Force and we have a lot of eggs. So um, basically what, what we have is every pipeline has multiple stages. So in the first stage we validate the syntax. The second stage we deploy it to our ball pit, basically our lab environment, and we do a dry run deployment to our production environment, um, where we only feed it and see if it's not complaining, basically, because sometimes the data in prod is different than the lab, so we wanna make sure that it works on both sides. Then there's a pause that can't be visualized, but basically there's just a review bit. If the review is accepted, the wiki is deployed or updated, and it's deployed into production and enabled and these kind of things. So from a, from a, a pipeline perspective, uh, there's all kinds of steps. So you can see that it validated all detections and no warnings. So on a warning, it will only complain, but it will move on. But we can also generate errors based on whatever is in there. Um, and that's the same on the deployment side. So now they, it checks whether the rule's already there and it's the same as what we wanted to deploy and then it's skipping it. If it's a new one, it will just deploy what's new. If there's something different, it will actually pull it, store it in the log, and then push the new stuff, because that's what we agreed, right? The, the Git bit is our single source of truth, but at least we record what was there in prod. So even if it's a small change, we know that somebody made a change, we can have a look at it, 
and we can actually, yeah, we can either decide whether we want to include it into our into our Git repo or not, or talk to the person who's like, hey, why did you do it there? We, um, so it's just a nice check. And then the same goes for the update of the wiki and the deployment of the production environment. So those are, are way simpler because we already checked everything. So some of the errors are, are, are yeah, not, not the easiest to read, but once you get used to this flow, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're actually quite flexible there. And it will already tell you like, hey, some of the things are missing or, or whatever. So we, we made some changes to that to make it more user friendly. One of the other things that we have in the pipeline next to a linting bit is we built a language server for Custo, which is the, the query language that we use. And we can do offline schema validation and it enables us to do some other things. So basically what it does, it automatically gets all the documentation from Microsoft and updates the schema that it's actually working against. So it's sort of emulating a Sentinel or a Defender for Endpoint instance. Um, which allows us to build um, some additional custom parsers and things in, in it as well. Um, and that's what I just said. So we open sourced it and we also host an instance which you can run in your own pipeline if you want. We don't log anything, um, so we don't wanna know what you're doing with it. Um, and basically what that does is it uses those ARM templates that I started out with. So how you deploy it to Microsoft, you also push it against this API. Um, which basically says which environment in it, uh, the query itself, and, and of course a lot of other stuff, but it ignores that. And you can just feed it into the API with the simplest query ever. And it gives a lot of output, so we can't read this. So one of the things it does is it tells you which columns are coming out of your query. So what is the result in fields that you get back? And why do you want that? It's basically if, if I, expect something as an analyst or I have entity mappings or other stuff in my, in my detection logic and in my documentation, then you wanna make sure that's actually there. Um, but it will also do all, all kinds of parsing errors. So if there's an error in your query, it will already tell you here before it actually goes into a production instance or a test instance. And also it tells you some, some other nice things is which, uh, which tables you're working with and which uh, reference columns, uh, basically which columns are you querying? So, so if you don't have that data, then it will start complaining about it. Um, and afterwards it will start generating all kinds of documentation overviews. So we have a sort of a list of all of our detections, which platforms they're using and these kind of things. It's not the most pretty, but it's super efficient. And per client, we also generate an overview of which version are they running? What is the latest version? Um, what, how is it called in their environment? When was it published? What's the status of it? And does it need updating? Because in some cases, the client actually might want to have an older version because they're still running, I don't know, 40 nets from five years ago where the schema is actually different than the one that is in our current detection. So we want to have that flexibility there. Um, and then what we started adding as well, because the wiki is nice, but a uh, portal is nicer, so we built a portal that's automatically generated every time we merge something into the main branch, where we can have all kinds of easier dissections. So we can quickly see, hey, do we have a detection for AWS? And then you can just click it and get a list of an overview, and you get a prettier version of the documentation just rendered this way. Um, it's all marked down on the back end, so it, it, it's the same and might be a bit familiar, but it's a little bit friendlier to look at. And of course, we can also generate all these nice fancy heat maps. Um, and we color it based on prevalence of, de of detections. So the darker the color, the more detections we have for it. Because you can't always cover everything in one detection, right? Um, and then last bit is basically the unit testing. So now we built all these detections, we roll them out. But how do we know they're working? So that we, had, we had a couple of goals in mind. So we want to make sure that the agent actually is logging the events that we expect when an attack is happening, because otherwise, how can you detect it? Um, the format of the logging is still consistent, like the, the Fortinet example, but it can be for anything. Also, Microsoft has a tendency to sometimes change schemas and not always be uh, super exact in their way of logging. So we wanna yeah, make sure that it's actually still doing what we expect it to do. But also, if, are they even arriving? So yeah, if it doesn't arrive there and it's generated, what's the point of having it? Um, and, there, and then the last one is also, if, is there an out-of-the-box, uh, it's kind of doing weird, 
is there an out-of-the-box detection coming from the EDR, for instance, now on a detection that we also wrote, so that we can have a difference to see, hey, does it actually make sense to keep it? Because maybe the out-of-the-box detection is, is equally good, so we can deprecate one of our own detections, saving some compute time and maintenance hassle. Um, and ideally, each use case can have like at least one of the test uh, cases that we have. Sometimes it has multiple because an attack can be executed in various ways and it's incorporated into the detection, but we flag that all. So some design principles that we had is, is where possible, actually do the attack. So don't mimic it. Um, but also, most importantly, and this is where a lot of the other tools miss it, I think, in my opinion, is where if when I execute an attack, I also want to make sure that the attack succeeded. So I want to measure that. Because I can run a script and move on and then see, hey, the detection didn't work. And then you're looking at the problem and at the wrong end, maybe, right? If the attack already failed, then the detection will never trigger. So how, how do you validate that? Um, and have variables that can, can differ in every environment, like a domain name, file name, location, username, these kind of things. So you can be a little bit more flexible there. Um, and if you do an endpoint-based thing, uh, focus on the EDR and not the AV, because the AV is trivial, everybody can bypass that with a little bit of effort, so our detections usually aren't incorporating that. So, um, and that's where we started designing our own YAML format again, uh, which is based on Atomic Red Team, which is awesome. Uh, just extended it a bit with the things that we were missing from it. So from a logical flow perspective, uh, we have a detection rule that might have an attack script, that goes into that attack script pipeline that we run every 15 minutes. Uh, but you shouldn't do that. You should do it once a month or whatever if you do it on an internal basis. Um, we just do it a lot so that we can quicker see results and have better maintenance that way. Um, from there, that attack script can execute it directly on a host via SSH or some other agent that we have built ourselves. But we can also integrate with some of the commercial and breach and attack tools like uh, Prelude, and but we can also work with a Caldera or some other, some other tools, uh, as long as they can work with that YAML format that we uh, that we have. So that that then executes it on a target. The target reports the status back, including did it succeed or not, because that's very important to us. And the tool, or actually the pipeline, depending on where we run it, feeds that result into Sentinel. But the target also has a role there because they have an agent running and. Uh, they log stuff, so they either alert or log to Sentinel. The alert gets generated. And from there, we can actually start correlating, hey, the attack ran, it was successful, and it was detected or not. Um, so that goes all into a dashboard, um, which is um, the manual bit of looking at it. We can also run it from the pipeline that I showed you earlier. Uh, and we can generate a Slack alert and say, hey, there's a discrepancy from what I expected and uh, what is actually there. So for instance, uh, the attack is failing now where it used to work, or the other way around where the attack is still succeeding, but it's not detected anymore. So we need to look at it and do some maintenance. Um, and that can be either on the attack side or on the detection logic where so either one of them is failing. And then to, to have a very simple example uh, to, to what it looks like, um, this is just, again, a YAML format where we show uh, what it's li linked to, uh, which detection we expect to trigger. So this is tied to one of ours, but it can be many. So sometimes we trigger multiple detections with one attack. Um, and that also includes out-of-the-box stuff from the EDR or the, the SIM. So we, we look at those as well, because, yeah, why not? Um, where we can run it from, so that in this case it's only one variable, but it can also be uh, many from a domain name and these kind of things, some global dependencies. So we built one hijacking DLL, which we run in multiple attacks. It's just easier than, than tailoring uh, it completely. And then a basic script where it's also checking did it succeed or not, and it cleans up after itself, because we want to have a, a clean system afterwards. And then some of those dashboards examples are, are relatively simple, where we have a lot of detonations, and we can also see over time how well is it doing um, and have an overall success rate that we calculate. So we basically know, okay, this 100% of the time ran and the two, uh, the two red ones we need to do something about, uh, preferably sooner than after a couple of weeks, right? But that, that can happen. And then on the flip side, we also have a dashboard for all the detections, which are tied to the tech scripts, but 
we can basically measure, hey, it executed 50 times, and we detected it, I don't know, 37 times. So why? Um, and of course, we can click everything and drill down into the raw logs and see what was actually uh, executed and, and why it's not detected. So in some cases, we re actually ran into some issues where alert grouping and these kind of things are also occurring, uh, which might be either a misconfiguration in the SIM or MDE in this case also wants to be smart and just group everything into one single incident and then it's not detected anymore. So that's sometimes also where these numbers come from. But this only occurs if you do it in our way, where we run it every 15 minutes, which in a production or a large uh, enterprise doesn't always make sense. So then you do it once a week, once a month. Um, and then you just have a pipeline that deploys an environment. You run all your stuff. Um, you let it sit for a bit. And then you kill the environment. And you start up with a clean slate the next time. Uh, and then somebody actually has to look at the results. Because otherwise, yeah, you can, you can test it. But if nobody's validating what is tested, then you're, you're wasting a lot of resources. So to, to wrap up, because time is up. <laughs> um, just some simple, simple things, right? So, so detection as code provides a lot of quality control, automation. It's, it's usually ease of life for most of the detection engineers or the people maintaining this. And, and you have a lot of opportunities for review and improvements uh, there. Uh, it ensures a single source of truth. It allows for automated deployment, even across a lot of environments. It doesn't really matter how much, that just uh, config. Um, and it's, it's self-documenting. Uh, yeah, provided that the detection engineers do a good job and they get flagged with reviews if they don't. Um, and, and the best thing uh, that I like about it is that, uh, that there's some certainty into the, from the validation perspective that you actually know that it's working and it's doing the stuff that you want. So, mo not the most technical talk, but if you're, if you're curious about more, we can, we can discuss a bit on the panel, but we're also having a booth uh, behind there so if you want to see a little bit more or ask some questions, I'm more than happy to answer them there. But uh, thanks for coming out. <laughs>